Please welcome Dr. Richard Pimentel, internationally renowned consultant, keynote speaker, and professional trainer. Richard is one of North America's premier speakers on disability and employment issues and works with major companies and education organizations on workforce diversity, self-advocacy, disability inclusion, and attitude change. Richard's life story was portrayed in the Warner Brothers full-length motion picture, Music Within. Welcome, Richard Pimentel. Funny how things happen. Only in hindsight do you realize how something can change your entire life. I need volunteers to stay behind. This is your chance to be a hero. I always wanted to be a hero. I was deaf. I can't authorize government funds to send you to college. You're deaf. I'm what? It's a deaf joke. <laughs> we cannot plan the events that shape us. Look like you have a coke problem. May I? You better w wash your hands. Uh, this uh, may be contagious. <laughs> you want to sit down, Einstein? Yeah, yeah, sure. We cannot predict the moments that define us. I think you two need to leave. You're making the other customers very uncomfortable. He's very sorry for turning your customers' stomachs. That's obviously your job. You guys can leave, or I can call the police. Call them. Ah! You okay? The next time, use a blinker. But we can all change the world around us. I'm deaf, but I can see what you're saying from over there. My friend is not a retard. He's got cerebral palsy. See, it affects his motor skills. It means that his brain is perfectly functioning while his body's more or less useless. Think of it as the opposite of you. You don't need to change their minds about people's disabilities. You need to change their minds about themselves. This fall... What is it that you're afraid of? That he can't work with you or that you can't work with him? ...comes the story of a man. The U.S. government wants me to create a program on hiring the disabled. I'll be training every agency, CIA, NASA, all of them. Yeah! ...who gave a voice to the voiceless. You don't have a clue how good this is and hope to the forgotten. Americans with Disabilities Act says that you can't discriminate against people simply because they don't look like you. The differences that you make, the ones of lasting importance, they're the little differences that you make in the life of another person. Music Within. Well, good morning. I am up. Uh, I'm assuming you can hear me. Okay, good. Well, I'm I am Rich Pimentel, and I would uh, I'm I'm so thrilled to be here. Uh, one of the things that I would I would like to start with is actually is a, a an old uh, African saying that meant a lot to the disability movement. Uh, maybe you've heard it before. It said, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with others. The disability movement did not go fast, but we have gone far. The others are too numerous to mention in a, in, in a history. Uh, I would be here for days, uh, but risking uh, uh, leaving people out, which I obviously will, I'd like to just mention some that have, 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 have touched, touched my life, uh, if, you, if you will. Of course, Justin Dart, you know, you know about Justin, a, a, a lawyer named Chris Bell, who is with the uh, EEOC, Judy Human, many of you know uh, uh, Judy, uh, John Kemp. Uh, Evan Kemp, who was the chair of the EEOC uh, during the time that the ADA was uh, 
was signed, Kai Feldblum. And let, let me say this about Kai. Here's my definition of Kai Feldblum. She's the smartest person in the room, no matter what room you are in. How's that? I, I admire her uh, and respect her uh, uh, so much. And of course, uh, um, Harkin and Tony Quello, uh, so many people. But I'm not going to give a history of all those people. Uh, because on this journey, these people were individuals, just as I was an individual. And what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the ADA from my perspective on this on this group journey, if you will. You, you saw the trailer, and so you know that I was uh, I was in Vietnam. Uh, I was with the 101st Airborne Division, 1968-69. Uh, uh, we were there for the Tet Offensive. Uh, towards the end of that tour, uh, we were on a hill uh, guarding uh, uh, a radio relay station. Lots of uh, radio people up there. And we were going to have about 100 troops to guard, uh, guard them. The helicopters came in for the first drop and uh, dropped uh, all the radios and all the radio people and our little five-man team and a little bit of ammunition and not much food and hardly any water and left. And then they were going to come back with everything else, including 100 extra men. They never returned. Fog came about the hill and they couldn't resupply us or get us. Uh, and rescue us. Uh, it came to our being trapped on that hill. They had a solution. They were going to uh, artillery part of the hill. And when the enemy left that part, uh, then everyone was going to run down where they had uh, abandoned and meet helicopters. But there was a problem. The problem was they needed five people to stay behind to close the back door to make sure that everyone wasn't followed as they were going down the hill. Our five-man team was the team that was asked to do that. And there was the first lesson that I learned that shaped my life. Maybe the most important lesson I've ever learned. I said to my sergeant, why us? Why me? And he said, well, it's your it's responsibility. And I said, responsibility? Uh, to who? And I remember he looked at me and he said, Pimentel, you don't even know the meaning of the word responsibility, do you? And I said, I guess not. And then he said something I never forgot and I've lived with all of my life. He said, responsibility is a word that consists of two words, the word response and the word ability. We all have abilities and we all find ourselves in situations where something needs to be done. If you have the ability to do the right thing, he said, what then is your response? to your ability. Responsibility is not what you owe to others. It's what you owe to yourself. He said, do we have the ability to do this thing? I said, yes. Then what then is our response? What is your response, Pimentel? I said, we do it. That is a lesson that has carried me through my now 72 years. Well, as you can tell from the movie, we, we, we got off the hill and then uh, we, uh, we were rewarded with a night in the beer bunker and someone dropped a rocket on the bunker. What, what are the odds on something like that? Uh, I came back with a significant hearing loss, a traumatic brain injury. Later, I found out Agent Orange poisoning. Uh, and I went 
to, to rehab. And there I was first introduced to an idea that I would be struggling against all of my life. Interesting enough, it wasn't rehab's fault. It was just the way the country was working. I wanted to be a professional speaker. I wanted to be a consultant, but I'm deaf and brain injury, learning to walk again, learning to talk again. Basically, I was told that I couldn't do those things. And I realized something that not only for me, but for a lot of disabled veterans and a lot of people with disabilities, well, we have dreams. We have important dreams. And for too many years and for too long, people with disabilities have been told that you must modify your dreams to be consistent with your circumstances. You must change your dreams to fit your circumstances. And after thinking about that, I decided perhaps there's another way. Perhaps we should modify our circumstances to fit our dreams. That is what ADA is about. That's what reasonable accommodation is about. That's what you who are listening to me right now are about. We can take people with disabilities who are ready to give up their dreams because of their circumstances and say, keep those dreams. Let's change your circumstances. And that was ultimately the whole purpose. You know, there are a lot of people who had all kinds of agendas in ADA and they were all very valid agendas. But for some of us, I'll tell you what the agenda was. And I hope that it rings true for some of you. Here is what I believe. I wanted a world where people with disabilities, especially young people with disabilities, could live a spontaneous life. When I came back from Vietnam, a spontaneous life was not something many of us could live. So I went to college, didn't get my rehab program, but I went to college on the GI Bill. And there I met someone who uh, you wouldn't have heard of nationally, but he meant an awful lot to me. His name was Art Honeyman, and he had cerebral palsy. And he had like a lot of cerebral palsy. Like he had, he had more cerebral palsy than Justin Bieber has uh, parole officers. Anyway, I met him. His speech was unintelligible. He was at the college. Uh, he couldn't move his wheelchair forward. He had to push it backward with, with one foot. And uh, I was learning to read lips in college. Uh, uh, and I'm taking, taking uh, lip reading courses. And one day, an eventful thing happened, changed my life. There he was in the cafeteria. He was trying to open a, a Coca-Cola, a can of Coke. Couldn't get it open. I walked up to him and I, I, I took it away from him. And I took a straw and put it in. I said, let me help you. And I, put this, I put, gave it back to him. And uh, I said, don't talk to me. I'm deaf. You know, I'm learning to read lips. I can't read your lips. I'll get seasick. Uh, and as I started to walk away, he grabbed me. And he wants to talk to me. Wow. No one can understand him. How could I understand him? And when he started to talk, the heavens simply opened up. What happened? I understood every word he said. The nature of his speech from the cerebral palsy caused him to have a lot of very high-pitched sounds that he really didn't mean to make, but they were highly distracting to everyone. And what he was saying was happening at a very low guttural level. 
Well, I couldn't hear all that high pitched stuff. If any of you who have been in the military or know about d disabled veterans know that uh, combat uh, hearing losses are very, very common. And most of them destroy your upper register hearing. It's just the nature of explosions. I couldn't hear all the distractive sounds that he made. All I could hear was what he was saying. And that's when I realized something. I realized that for every adversity that I have, I am presented a key, a key to a door that I don't even know existed, but someday I'll have to open. If Art hadn't had cerebral palsy, I never would have understood him. If I hadn't been blown up in a bunker, I never would have understood him. And we became friends. And he taught me a lot. And part of that journey was part of the ADA. Uh, one day, uh, he called me. We were in the dorm, and he knocked over his phone. He would do that, and the operator would come on. He would make art sounds, I used to call it, and then they'd send it to my room. So I got a call, and he said, it's my birthday. He said, uh, it's my birthday and uh, pancakes. I know what he wanted. He wanted me to go over to his room, get him dressed, take his wheelchair down eight flights of stairs. Uh push him 14 blocks in Portland, Oregon, to the pancake house, pull him up another two flights of stairs, and we're going to have pancakes. Well, we did that. When we got there, uh, the waitress refused to serve us. And uh, this is about 1971, two. The waitress said something to him that I will never forget because I didn't know the world was like that at this time. She said, I won't serve you. You're the most disgusting looking thing I've ever seen in my life. I can't believe you want me to bring you food. Get out. I thought people like you were supposed to die at birth. I couldn't believe it. I turned to Art. What's he going to say? And he smiled. You see, Art was a genius, but he was better than a genius. He was an evil genius. And uh, here's what happened. He looked at me and said, Richard, why is she talking to you that way? <laughs> well, you know something? Uh, I said, she's not talking to me. She's talking to you. And we got an argument over who she was talking to. And then they called the police and the police came and said we had to leave. And then when the police said we had to leave, Art said, I want to go to jail. And Richard wants to go to jail, too. I could have left. They would have taken Art to jail. But here's what I learned. You never leave a fallen comrade on the battlefield. And here's the other thing I learned. You don't leave one when they fall at home, either. So I went to jail. You can look it up if you want. We got arrested under what's called an ugly law, Portland, Oregon, pancake house. Harvard did a study on a uh, big thing on that. It was kind of, kind of interesting. So we got thrown into the, if you will, the disability movement. I didn't like the way that veterans were being treated. And because of that, uh, I decided just to help all my disabled vet friends. I got a job as a job developer for a private uh, 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 job placement company, Snelling & Snelling. Worked my way up to be a regional manager, placed disabled veterans for free. And then one day I just quit, opened up my home and uh, invited all the disabled vets in Portland, Oregon to come. And I found them jobs uh, with my phone. And we worked on that, started training employers, and uh, got a call one day and said, uh, President Carter's starting this program. 
Uh, he wants to hire disabled vets to come work for the state and get jobs for other disabled vets. It's called DVOP. And you're the only disabled vet we can find who knows anything about job developing. So will you do it? And I said, yes. And we started. And I started working more with employers, developed the uh, windmill program, which was an attitudinal program. You say, what? what? Well, I, I thought ADA was all about accessibility. Attitude is so important. You know, when the ADA was signed into law, it was an amazing thing. I don't know how many of you ever heard uh, George Bush Sr.'s speech uh, when, when, uh, uh, when they, when they uh, signed it uh, there. Uh, but I'd like to share an idea with you if I can, okay? Uh, I'm going to read part of something because you don't want to misquote uh, George Bush Sr. So uh, pardon me for, for, for reading it, but I want to get the words right. Here's what he said. Today, America welcomes to the mainstream of life all our fellow citizens with disabilities. We embrace you for your abilities and for your disabilities, for our similarities and our differences, for your past courage and future dreams. Last year, we celebrated a victory of international freedom even the strongest person could not scale the Berlin Wall to gain the elusive promise of independence that lay just beyond. So together, we rejoice when it fell. Now, I sign legislation that takes a sledgehammer to another wall, one which has for too many generations separated Americans with disabilities from the freedom they could glimpse, but could not grasp. We rejoice as this barrier falls, claiming together that we will not accept and will not excuse and we will not tolerate discrimination in America. ADA was not just a bunch of rules on how you could not and could not hire someone with a disability. It was a statement that persons with disabilities are not just to be hired if they can do the job, but they can be valued. Valued not for overcoming a disability, but valued with what the disability has brought them, what the disability has taught them. My disabilities, well, they haven't always been my best friend, but they have always been my best mentor. What have they given me? They have taught me patience. They have taught me confidence because when I fail at something, I know that I can start again. They have taught me empathy. They have taught me courage. And they have taught me the importance of self-advocacy. Young people with disabilities need to learn that their disability is not defined by their overcoming it, but from their learning from it, from their growing from it. And we, as employers, as job developers, as rehab people, need to see that. You know, when the ADA was in fact signed, I was over at the EEOC and I was in Evan Kemp's office. He was the chair of the EEOC. He took uh, over the EEOC uh, after Clarence Thomas went to the Supreme Court. And by the way, Clarence Thomas was the biggest advocate for the hiring of people with disabilities I had ever met up to that time. And Evan was a superlative. And there was a knock at the door. And Evan said, yes. And the secretary came in and said, we have a lot of reporters who want to come in and ask you something. Well, there you go. And I, I said, Evan, I'll just leave. And he says, no, Richard, don't leave. 
I want you to hear this. So I stayed. The reporters came in. And this is what they said. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, now that the ADA has been signed, people with disabilities will not have any problems anymore. Right? Evans just laughed. You know what he said? A lot of people misinterpret the ADA. It had just been signed that afternoon. He said they think it is a trampoline, that people with disabilities will bounce on and rise to new heights. But it's not. The ADA is not a trampoline. The ADA is a safety net. A place that no one should ever have to go lower than. The real key to success of people with disabilities will not be the ADA, but coupled with the ADA, a change of attitudes. It will be when we value people with disabilities, value their experience, and value what they can contribute. What he said, quite simply, was that disability should be a valid part of every corporate diversity program. And I thought, wow, the ADA was not the end of everything, was it? It was just the beginning. And we started doing training on attitudes. We looked and we asked, what, what, why are employers reluctant to hire people with disabilities? And a lot of people said, well, they lack confidence in people with disabilities' ability to do the job. And a lot of people thought that. And then we realized that that wasn't true. What we realized was something much more exciting. It wasn't that they necessarily lacked confidence in people with disabilities' ability to do the job. They lacked confidence in their own ability to supervise them, to work with them, to hire them, to manage them. And what we needed to do was not to teach them about people with disabilities, not to change their mind about people with disabilities, but in fact, change their minds about themselves. That's what the whole windmill program was about. It's a training program that employers use for managers and supervisors and HR and administrators. It became the number one training program for SHRM during their early ADA days uh, to make people feel more comfortable with working with people with disabilities and make them feel more comfortable with their ability, in fact, to do so. I believe sincerely that the history of the ADA is also part of the future of the disability movement. The EEOC does a great job but the real progress that's going to be made for people with disabilities will come from organizations like yours, from employers who say, let us look for uh, the, the positives. Let us, let, let us look for how accommodations can help people be the absolute best employee that they can possibly be. Uh, I believe that the future is going to be when, when every young person with a disability uh, is able to be trained uh, on what their disability has taught them and how it, is what is, how it has helped make them into the person they are and have them like the person they are, to be able to talk about it, to ask for accommodations, to work with employers. These are the, uh, I think, the ultimate goal of what we wanted because we wanted 
people with disabilities to be able to live a truly spontaneous life. So as you are in this conference, what I'd like to, to share with you is that my experience uh, was coming in believing that I had lost something when I had lost my hearing and when I became disabled. And what I learned from my journey was I have been given something that has been very, very useful. Now we have a challenge coming up and I want to th throw that challenge to you if I can. Uh, zombie apoc apocalypse, we're there. Uh, COVID. Some people say, well, why would you bring this up? Well, consider this. When it's over, it's not over. COVID is going to cause some problems. Problems with what? The residuals, those people who survive. There's some brain function problems, lung, heart, hearing. Uh, one of the things that I would ask your organization to consider, how in the world are we going to prepare for people who have gotten COVID, survived it, but are now coming back with disabilities because of it? Now to be one of the great corporate challenges, organizational challenges, rehab challenges for our field. We need to take a look at that, take a look at the resilience. I'm working on uh, uh, ideas for that now. I'm seeing some companies do some amazing things already. Let, let, let me share a quick one with you. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of a, a company called Starkey Hearing. Uh, they, they make hearing aids. They make maybe the best hearing aids in the world, I, I think. Uh, they looked at what what is happening uh, with with COVID, and people are wearing wearing masks. Obviously, I'm sure you all have masks. I have great Vietnam masks. I don't know if any of you have ever seen a Vietnam mask. Uh, you may not be able to see it. I, I am going to hold this up, and I'm going to read you what's on it. It says, "I'm a grumpy old Vietnam veteran." My level of sarcasm depends on your level of stupidity. I wear this around. Anyway, bottom line is that what they decided is a lot of people who are hard of hearing, wearing hearing aids, six feet away was a mask on. Hey, there are people with pretty good hearing who can't understand what someone with a mask is saying when they're six feet away, right? So guess what they decided to do? This is this is engineering genius. It's also exactly what we want. They got their artificial intelligence people with their hearing aid people. They created a new hearing aid. And guess what it does? You can give it to someone who's hard of hearing. They wear a hearing aid. And when someone talks into a mask, it will translate their, their speech so you can actually hear it and you can hear what people are saying six feet away with a mask. So people who may be using a hearing aid, uh, people, uh, veterans a lot, uh, will now be able to do things like go to school and hear the professor and things like that. Uh, these are incredible challenges that we have. And I would ask you to, to ask yourself, what can we do now to make sure that when COVID has run its course, whatever that is, that those people who have been affected by it and now have disabilities are getting the things we need, they, they need, and, and, and we are ready to effectively work with them as employees and applicants and be able to, to work with that. It's just a, a new challenge but it is no difference, if you will, than everything we've always done. In, in closing, I, I would like to tell you a little story. Uh, I'm 72 years old. 
And when I go home tonight, I will be going home to seven children. The youngest will be one year old in December 26. You say, how, 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 how could this be? Well, I'll tell you. I live in uh, Idaho, a place called Nampa, Idaho. I live with my wife, Debbie. We got a call years ago from the uh, child welfare people. They said, we have uh, just come out of a very bad place, drug home. We have children that cannot be returned to their parents. We have no place to put them. Uh, We wanted to know if you and your wife would take them. We don't have a foster home that could take them. Would you and your wife take them for a couple weeks till we find a suitable home? I said, we're not a foster home. They said, yeah, but we we saw your movie. I said, you're going to give me children because you you saw my movie? I said, they, they made a movie of Jeffrey Dahmer's. Would you give him children? This doesn't make any sense. And I said, well, what's the issue? They said, we just don't have any place for them. And we know that they're, they, they're going to have a, a few problems. So I looked at my wife and I said, well, how long do we have to decide? They said, three minutes. We're in your driveway in a van. And they brought him in. Lovely little girls. And two weeks turned to two months and turned to two years. And they called and said, well, we couldn't find anyone. We're going to adopt them out to families. I said, what family is going to take them all? And they said, well, we couldn't find a family that would take them all, but we found like, you know, five families that would take one apiece. I said, you're going to split them up. I said, yeah. I said, you can't do that. I said, what's the options? They said, well, you could adopt them. I turned to my wife. I said, what are we going to do? Okay. Have you ever told someone that you love something like really private and they've later used it against you? Yeah, by the way, the answer would be yes. Well, I've been telling my wife about that sergeant in Vietnam for I don't know how many years. And she looked at me and said, Richard, do we have the ability to raise these children? I said, yeah. Are we facing a situation here where we can make a difference? I said, yeah. So she said, what then is your response to your ability? Wow. We adopted them the next day. And so I want to say to each and every one of you, what what my old Sergeant Span said to me in Vietnam. What are your abilities? Employers? Rehab? Lawyers? EEOC? Advocates? HR? What are your abilities? And are we headed towards a time where there will be a circumstance when we can make a difference with our abilities for people with disabilities, for people coming off this pandemic? What then, I ask you, what is your response? to your abilities. That is our responsibility. I've lived that way all my life and I've not regretted a single moment of it. You have abilities. They're there for some reason. Use them. What's your response? 
the ADA was the response of my generation. And you, you're not going to go fast. You're going to go far. And this organization of yours will go far together. Thank you.